Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to South Park Church. My name is Lindsay Rich. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is just really great to see everyone and to be able to worship with you today. I'm Melissa Hoffman, and I am a member here and um, part of the leadership team, and I'm excited to be here as well. Yes, and so we just want to extend a really warm welcome to you today, especially if you're a guest with us today, um, if you're worshiping online with us, or if you're in the room. We are really genuinely glad um, to be able to spend some of our Sunday morning all together. For sure. I can't believe Thanksgiving has already come and gone. I know. <laughs> we were just saying that earlier. We were like... It really is starting Advent today, so it, it's exciting. Um, but, you know, we are a community of people that um, is not just any community, but we're a church. And so we are a community that gathers to worship Jesus. And if you want to learn more about who we are as a church community, we would love to invite you to do that. The best place is on our website at southparkchurch.com forward slash online um, if you want to, to do that. And, of course, on the website, there is a place for you to sign up for our e-newsletter. Letter. And so you can um, sign up and every Wednesday in your inbox, you will get an email that tells you about all of the stuff that's happening. And this is a really good time to sign up for that because there's a lot of stuff that is happening. I'm actually going to, you know, be, well, we're going to be talking about some of that today, but it, to remember it, right? So like uh, sign up for the e-newsletter so that you can have it in written form as well. One of the things that you'll see in our newsletter every week is a prayer list. So I personally have been a beneficiary of being a part of this prayer list. Um, my husband's mother had some surgery, and uh, it has been really wonderful to feel the love from my South Park Church family praying for us. Um, but you can put prayer requests on the website if you want it to just be heard by the pastors and check that box as well. But otherwise, you will have this whole family praying for you. And I can tell you it's a really amazing feeling. So, Yeah. Um, that is one of the ways that we try to be generous with each other is in the time and um, prayers that we offer to each other. Generosity is another one of the core values that we talk about here because we, we follow Jesus in generosity with our lives and that's with our time and, and with, with our attitudes and with our hearts and also with our finances. And so if that's something that you're interested in learning more about or joining us in that, we'd love to talk more with you um, about that. Um, if you want to make a financial gift, you can do that in the room, you can do that online. And we are still collecting stewardship cards. You may remember that we um, handed those out a while back. We still have more if you didn't get one or if you haven't turned one in. And these are ways for you to communicate with the church, ways that um, you are living out generosity here in this community. Or if there's a way that, that you want to start um, serving in a different way, either um, with the kids' ministry or with the students or with the ushers or greeters, there's lots of ways uh, for you to get involved. And we would love to have you join in the life in the ministry happening here yes and also oh, yeah. <laughs> no I was gonna say you you may recognize so Melissa we were talking about her coming up here right and I'm so excited that she's up here and we were saying you know everybody knows kind of knows who you are because you're a part of the community and leadership and I was like also, you were on the video last week. So I don't know if you were here last Sunday or if you saw the service, but if so, you saw Melissa on the video. You yeah. want to talk about that a little more? Yeah, absolutely. So I quit my job in January, December of last year and started working full-time for ERO, which we are a nonprofit um, that helps fund scholarship for scholarships for students in Haiti. And a lot of you know that we have a partnership with this community in Bayonne. We helped bring clean water to one of the schools, one of the campuses in Zoranger, and um, we had a st sponsorship drive. We're going, one's happening right now, but we had the first week last week, and I'm here again this week. So if you're interested in getting more information about a student in Haiti, building a relationship with a family there, it really is an amazing opportunity, and so I'd love to talk to you about that. I can't tell you guys, I'm so incredibly proud of my church family. We sponsored 27 students last week. I really want to get to 30. So if there are of you out here that might want to sponsor a student, just let me know. I'll be on the table after the service. Um, yes. So an, another thing I wanted to tell you about is that there is a charge conference coming up. You may have attended one recently, and there is another uh, follow-up charge conference that's happening December 5th, which is next Sunday in the afternoon. So if you um, want to pro uh, participate in that, we can get you the Zoom link. Just email Tim in the church office so that um, you can join that. December 5th is in a busy day as well. We're going to have the kids' choir singing at both services, so make sure you're here next week.
going to be a real cool treat. Yes, it is going to be really fun to hear the kids singing. Um, and then on the 10th, we are going to have a really fun, exciting night that is happening here on our church campus um, where we're going to be doing a number of things. You know, we are trying to be good neighbors here. And so we're going to be delivering some gifts to some of our neighbors here in the Apex community in the afternoon if you want to join us for that. Then we are going to be having pizza on the fourth floor terrace. So if you haven't made your way up there and seen the terrace out there, it's a great spot. There's patio furniture. We're going to have some warmers and stuff out there. So we're going to be able to um, eat some pizza. And then after that, we're going to watch a movie all together, Elf, on the fourth floor. So up there, we have a big screen and a projector and stuff. And so we're just going to have a fun and cozy night um, of Christmas stuff, which is really exciting. And so and we hope you'll you join us. You can wear like your Christmas PJs or if you have an ugly Christmas sweater, there I mean, could be some prizes. You absolutely could do that. It's going to be really fun. Um, yeah, and, and we're really excited just to be able to use this space and to live in this space in more and more ways. And um, this will be a, a fun, fun thing to do. For sure. And then um, we have a lot of things happening after church today. There's a table out in the, right outside of the volunteer room as well for Pinewood Elementary. The Angel Tree is back. So if you guys are interested in uh, helping sponsor a classroom or a teacher, there's information at that table as well. So that's been something we've done for many years, and it's always really cool to pick a student. So. Yes. No, we, we were saying there are actually, so there's four tables lined up out there. We have our normal welcome table. So if you're a guest, we want you to stop there. Um, and then we have Ewo, and then we have signing up for Angel Tree. And then we have a new table that is for picking up Advent books and wreaths after the service. So, um, oh, Pastor Kyle, can you hand me that? I brought it and then I forgot to bring it up with me. So um, we have made these little kits for you, which, thank you. Um, are really fun. And so, you know, this is Advent. And so um, we often light candles um, in the church service, but we thought it would be really great for everyone to be able to do this at home. Um, and especially with COVID, we know not everyone can come or feels comfortable coming all of the time. Um, and so we have made these wreaths. Um, and so um, we have put them together and you can take one for free right after the service. So um, this is what they look like when they're all put together. Um, and this is what it looks like out on the back table. So you, right when you leave the sanctuary today, can grab one. So you'll get one bag and inside it has all of the candles and a little bit of greenery. And then you will get a plate that you can set it out on and you can put it on your table and light it at dinner every night or, or whatever um, so that you can be celebrating the coming of Jesus along with us. Um, and then we have another gift for you, which is an Advent devotional. So this is written by Adam Hamilton, and this is just a church-wide devotional read that we're going to do all together. So there's a table right outside, and you can pick up one of these and one of the Advent wreaths um, on your way out today. Um, and there's no cost to these. Um, we, we ordered these as um, a gift for you and for your family so that we can all celebrate Advent together. So that's a lot. <laughs> Without, that's a lot of announcements and a lot of things. Um, you know, there's two things to get, two, th two opportunities to sign up to serve, um, and all of these things that are happening. It's, it, it's um, a busy time of year, right? And also, we are here this morning to settle and to worship. And so we want to invite you to do that now and to join us as we worship. Um, so if you want to stand and join in our opening hymn, we have our women's ensemble who is going to be leading us today.
You may be seated. So today is the start of Advent. And um, in the ancient church calendar, Advent actually marks the beginning of the year. So this is a new year of sorts for us, right, where we tell the story of a new beginning. Advent is actually um, a Latin word, and it means coming or approach or arrival. And so this is the time where we tell the story of the arrival or, or the coming, the advent of God to us. Um, but we don't only look back and tell the story of Jesus' coming to earth. Advent actually holds our past, our present, and our future. So we remember that God came to be with us once, and we remember that God is with us still, and we remember that God is coming again to set things right in the world. And so in Advent, as we do that, we light candles on this Advent wreath. And each Sunday, we light a different candle, and the candles represent different things that um, tell the story of some of the, the, um, the gifts that Jesus' coming has brought us. And so today, Joan and Del McGill are going to light our first candle, which is the candle of hope. Good morning. Um, I want to read to you from Isaiah 60, verses 2 and 3. The whole earth is wrapped in darkness, all people sunk in deep darkness. But God rises on you. His sunrise glory breaks over you. Nations will come to your light, kings to your sunburst brightness. Today we light the candle of hope. We remember that the prophets foretold that the Messiah would come, bursting into the darkness with his light. This gift of hope remains with us still. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Thanks, Joan and Dell. Will you pray with me? Emmanuel, we thank you that you have come and that you came to be with us and that you are with us still and that you are coming again. And Lord, during this season of Advent where there is um, a remembering of, of longing and waiting, the anticipation of something or someone that is coming, Lord, we recognize that that sense of longing and waiting is with us still. In so many ways, that is the posture of people since forever. That we have been longing and we have been waiting and we have been um, anticipating what will come. And God, we thank you that we do not wait without hope. So, Lord, we thank you that in these different areas in our own lives where we are longing for something, where we are longing for someone, where we are aching and waiting for relationships to be mended, for situations to shift, for hearts to heal, for um, provision to come, for justice to show up. Lord, we thank you that we have this hope that you are coming again to set things right in the world. And Lord, we thank you that you did not leave us to just hope and wait on our own, but that you actually came to be with us and that you have sent your Holy Spirit to live in us, that you have given us your name, that you've called us your own, and that you have invited us to join you in your story of redemption that you are writing in the world. So God, even as we remember your coming and even as we anticipate you coming again, we thank you, Lord, for your invitation to live into that hope now. So Lord, we ask that you would raise us up as people who know something of your hope and that we would bring the news of your hope and your life and your joy and your peace and your love into these dark places, into lonely places, into places where there is sadness and brokenness and hunger and famine and violence. 
Lord, use us to bring the message of Jesus and of your hope to the world. And now we pray together the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I once had someone ask me, where do you hail from? I remember thinking, where people don't talk like weirdos. <laughs> Of course he meant, where are you from? And uh, I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, here uh, in the mountains of North Carolina in this wonderful state, and I loved it. It was a magical place to grow up. I had a great childhood, and who wouldn't like growing up in Asheville because the city had its own castle, right? The Biltmore Estate, the big castle there. And my mom told me that once, I think I was four years old, we had gone to see the Biltmore House, and I came home, and I informed her that that was my castle and no one else's. So, um, but I, I, I had a great childhood. It was a, a great place to grow up and establish lifelong friends. Uh, I chose to follow Jesus in Asheville. I had my first girlfriend in Asheville. Just a lot of warm memories in Asheville. And it used to bother me when I was like in school and some of my friends would talk badly about the city that we were from. Some of them called it Trashville. Can't wait to get out of here, right? This is too small a city. There's not enough going on, and I don't like living in Trashville, and that used to make me angry. And I, I found that people do that a lot in life. We're thinking about where you grew up, how many people liked it, how many didn't. You know, usually where you are is not good enough, and people are always wanting to go to the next place. If you grew up in Asheville, you wanted to grow up in Charlotte. If you grew up in Charlotte, you want to grow up in Chicago. If you grew up in Chicago, you want to grow up in New York City. If you grew up in New York City, you want to grow up in, in Las Vegas or Los Angeles, right? It's never good enough. But what's interesting is when people grow up, they become nostalgic. And if they've moved away, they miss the childhood home where they were and they wish they could go back to that place. So in your life, what is your hometown? Where do you hail from? What uh, is where, where did you grow up? What, what kind of place was that? Was that a small town, medium-sized town, large town? Was that a good experience for you? Do, are you glad that that's where you grew up? How did that shape you and who you are and, and where you came from? Over this next few weeks in this series of Advent, we're going to be going on the journey, the journey of Jesus, right? The birth of Jesus. And uh, we're going to base it on the study that Pastor Lindsay talked about, these really cool books that you can grab as you leave today. Uh, it's based on a study by Pastor Adam Hamilton, and it talks about the journey uh, geographically uh, to get to where Jesus was born, right? Who were the key people in, in his life, uh, his ancestors, his parents, that kind of stuff? Where did they come from? How did that shape who they are? And so... I'd like over the next few weeks to challenge you to think about where did you come from in your life? What shaped you, where you grew up, the people that were around you? Uh, and also at the same time to be thinking about your journey with God now. What does that look like? What, what, how is your walk with God? Where has God brought you from and where does God have you now? And where might be God leading you to next in the future? What kind of a journey are we on? How does Christmas Day and the attempt to get there affect our everyday lives? What kind of a journey are you on in your life with God? Well, today we're going to dive right into the Bible. We're going to look at some of those early uh, stories about Jesus and the birth of Jesus. Uh, in the Bible, Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel talk about the birth of Jesus. Uh, we're going to be in Luke's Gospel today. And so let's look at a location that was very important leading up to the birth of Jesus. So let's dive into Luke today, beginning with chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, uh, this is a woman who was past childbearing years, and now she's become pregnant. She's going to give birth to John the Baptist, who is the cousin of Jesus, and he's going to prepare the way for Jesus when he's an adult. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, as she's carrying John the Baptist, God sent the angel Gabriel, an angel is a messenger, a supernatural messenger of God, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Galilee is a region in the northern part of Israel, and Nazareth is a town there, and uh, it's a very small town. I want to show you a picture of what it looks like today in Nazareth. We can pop that up there. Uh, it's really cool, uh, but in, in the day of Jesus, it was much smaller. I want to show you another picture. Um, this is a picture of me with my mom back in the late 90s in Nazareth, and uh, that's not Mary and Jesus, but it is Mary, Zale, and Kyle, <laughs> so uh, it's a neat town, and we look back at Nazareth, and we've probably heard the story of Jesus, and, and Nazareth is a, is a place that comes to mind, and it probably brings warm memories to those of us who know the Christmas story. Uh, but Nazareth was, uh, it was such a small town 
that when you read the list of the different towns and cities in first century Israel, it wasn't even on the list, right? So there might have been somewhere between 100 to 400 people living in Nazareth. It was a small town. It was the other side of the tracks, right? It's out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, it, it's kind of contrasted to another city that was nearby called Sephorus that had 30,000 people. Right, it was cosmopolitan, like the New York City of its day. Right, so you have thirty thousand people in this one city, and then the the, the nearest city, Nazareth, has about one to four hundred people. So Sephora's had like the cosmopolitan stuff going on. It was the place where the people who had stuff lived, and the have-nots, right, were on the other side of the tracks living in Nazareth. Nazareth had like a small spring of water, so that's probably why people moved there who wanted to get out of the big city uh, because water, right, in the Middle East in the first century was a big deal. There were some caves in Nazareth, so some people lived in caves, right? And so this is just a small town. And I'm guessing maybe some of the teenagers growing up in Nazareth call it, called it Trashereth, right? <laughs> Can't wait to get out of this small town. I'm going to move to Sephora and I'm going to get a job and that's where all the parties are. That's where we're going to go get work and just, I can't wait to leave this small dunk town, right? So Nazareth, Sephora. When we jump forward to Jesus' adult ministry and he's calling his disciples together, some of them are talking and they're talking about, well, where did Jesus come from? And someone's going to say, well, he came from Nazareth. And so one of the disciples named Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of that redneck small town in the sticks, right, on the other side of the tracks, right? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? So why in the world would God send a supernatural being, an angel, a messenger of God to the small, teeny, tiny, podunk town of Nazareth? Let's keep going and maybe see why God did that. There is a word uh, that comes out of Nazareth. It's a, it's a Hebrew word called netzer, right, which means a branch or a shoot. It's like if you can imagine if you cut down a tree and all that's left is the dead stump, uh, you think the tree's dead and, and gone, right? But then like a, a green shoot comes out, right, and there might be some new life coming out of that dead tree, right? The country of Israel had been chopped down a couple of good times in its history uh, because they were doing the wrong thing against God. And so they'd been wiped out a couple of different times and a lot of people had given up on Israel, right? But this word Netzer, which is the, the background for Nazareth, gives us a clue that something's going to come out of Nazareth that's good, that's new life, that's going to be helpful for people. And so let's see what that is. Let's dive back into Luke's gospel here, Luke one twenty seven. So the angel was sent to Nazareth in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, right? So David's the greatest king in the history of Israel. He ruled about a thousand years before this is happening, right? Where the angel Gabriel goes and uh, this virgin's gonna be married to a man named Joseph and the virgin's name was Mary, right? So the angel is sent to a young lady named Mary. She was probably somewhere around the age of 13, which we in 21st century America think that's a little young to be engaged to get married, right? But in first century Israel, the life expectancy was 35 years old. So Mary is pretty much near middle age, right? She's probably able to have children. And so that's when young women got married because they're not going to live long, right? So this angel Gabriel goes to this town of Nazareth, uh, to where Mary is engaged to this man named Joseph. Let's keep going and see what happens. So the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Right? So this angel comes to Mary in this nowhere town and says, The Lord is with you and you are favored by God. This has got to be blowing Mary's mind. Like, who am I that an angel of God is coming to me to say that I am highly favored? Let's keep going. So she was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And who can blame her, right? <laughs> An angel shows up in nowhere and says, you are highly favored by God, right? Are you kidding me, right? Is this a prank? Is this a prank? What's going on? But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Again, the angel says, you have found favor with God, right? So when an angel repeats something, we probably want to pay attention to that because it's probably pretty important. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Jesus means God saves, right? So Mary's 
potential son is going to be coming to help save the world from itself. Right? He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Remember, David was the greatest king in the history of Israel. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants. Right, The whole nation of Israel traces back to Jacob forever. And his kingdom will never end. Mary, we've got big plans for you. Right? Big plans for little Nazareth. Big plans for you. All right, let's keep going. Well, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? Right? Not all the way married yet, right? Haven't consummated the marriage. And the angel answered, right? The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary's wondering, how can I have a baby when I haven't consummated my marriage yet, right? That's physically impossible. She didn't know about things like in vitro fertilization or that you know, God who created all of DNA is probably able to do whatever God wants to do. But what's going on here is that the angel is saying there needs to be a union between the divine nature of God and the human nature of Mary, that this son Jesus is going to be both. He will be divine. He will be the son of God, God himself, and also be a human being. This is going to be an important union. So God will take care of the details, Mary. And we're asking you to do this. Even Elizabeth, right, your relative, your cousin, is going to have a child in her old age, right? Elizabeth is past the age of childbearing. She wasn't able to conceive children, but now God is giving her the miracle of being pregnant. Right? And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month, right? God can do what God says, right? For no word from God will ever fail, right? How can you become pregnant when you're still a virgin? God's going to take care of that. Just look at your cousin Elizabeth. She's not supposed to have children in her old age, her old age but she is, right? Big things are happening in little Nazareth, Big things are happening in little Nazareth. And if you were Mary and the angel had come and given you this sales pitch, how would you respond to that? Would you be ready to be the mother of God himself? Right? Would you, what, what would you think at age 13? Right? Someone presented you with this proposition. Right? What, what would you say? Right? Did Mary want to be Mary? Right? We know how the story ends, right? But did Mary want to be Mary. I know when in churches all around the U.S. and around the world are casting their, their annual Christmas plays and, you know, it comes to the point of, well, who wants to be Mary? And all these hands get raised, right? People want to be Mary in the story, but in real life, how many of us would want to be Mary to take on what Mary was getting ready to take on? Right? What does it mean to have found favor with God for Mary? Another way of saying favor is grace, right? And grace is, is this definition, right? Goodness that we don't deserve. Kindness, salvation, forgiveness, right? That's what Jesus offers us, right? Forgiveness and life to the full and life everlasting. Mary, you are full of this grace, right? You are full of favor. And, and many of us will be like, well, Mary, you got to take that opportunity. That's a great opportunity, right? But it's also, it's a risk for Mary, isn't it? Right? Because people aren't going to understand that, that Mary talked to an angel, that God's going to make her pregnant when she's still a virgin, right? Joseph's going to find out about this, and he's probably going to lose it. He's probably going to break off the engagement. She's not going to have the wedding that she wanted. If people find out that she's pregnant outside of wedlock, then, then she could even be killed in first century Israel, right? They, they would line you up in front of a wall and throw rocks at you until you died. That could happen to Mary or even if they didn't do that, she could die in childbirth, right? The hospitals weren't what they were, you know, in the first century like they are in the 21st century. So there's a great risk of her dying from even having a baby. So we think about what does it mean for Mary to be favored? Right? I love this Adam Hamilton quote in, in this story, right? God's favor for Mary meant not a life of bliss, but a life of risk, right? You're going to do something amazing, but there's risk involved. And I'm not talking about like not wearing your seatbelt or eating a pound of jalapenos before you go to bed or jumping out of a plane, right? Mary was risking her life in this, her reputation. Right? God, is, God sometimes asks us to, to step out of our comfort zones, to go places that we might not want to go or to be with people that we might not want to be around or to do things that, might not wanna, that we might not want to do, right? And so for Mary, this finding favor with God on the one hand is exciting, but it also is full of risk. If you were Mary, what would you have said back to the angel? Well, let's see what Mary says in the midst of all of this. She says to Gabriel, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. 
right? And then the angel left her. Mary's like, boom, I'm in. I'm in, right? Doesn't say that she took a long time to think about it. Just says, like, immediately she's like, okay, I'm in. You want me to be the mother of God? I'll do that. Is there a risk involved? Yes, there's risk involved. Is this going to put me out of my comfort zone, risk my marriage, risk my reputation, maybe risk my life? Yes, it is. But I am the servant of God, and so I am in. And I think this is why God sent the angel Gabriel to little old poor old Nazareth out in the middle of nowhere because that's where Mary lived. And Mary had this incredible character, right, in the backwater, in the backwoods. And, and God sent the angel Gabriel there because God knew that Mary would say yes, that she had what it took to be the mother of God. Like her character was amazing. Right? And we have this humble beginning in the city of, or the town of Nazareth, right, a humble beginning for a humble Savior, right? Jesus is not going to be a mighty king or a military ruler or a politician. He's going to be a humble carpenter and so we see even the roots of Mary this this humble nature that's going to follow in the birth of Jesus and we find in Nazareth we find in in Mary like God works through unexpected people God works in unexpected places God works in unexpected ways outside of Jesus Mary's the most significant person in 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 the gift of salvation right without Mary there's no Jesus without Jesus we're not saved right that's a really big deal so what what's the point today what's what's the big idea what's the takeaway what what's the scripture trying to tell us i think this is it as we think about our journey right where you come from matters it's important where you come from right what shapes you to be who you are but not as much as where god is leading you now where you come from matters. It helps shape you into who you are, but not as much as where God is leading you now. Brothers and sisters, what is God calling you to do in your life? What messengers has God sent to you in your life? It might not be a divine, heavenly, supernatural angel like Gabriel that pops out, but I think God sends all of us messages through other people, through scripture, through prayer, through things that we see, right? It's important where you're from, but where's God leading you now? So I would say this maybe as a potential action step is say yes to God. Say yes to God. What is it God has called you to do right now? Right? Who is God sending you to? Where, where is God calling you to be? What is God calling you to do? Right? Say yes to God like Mary. Right? Here I am, God. Use me according to your will. Right, well, how do we know what God wants us to do? That's a big question. We don't always have a physical angel standing in front of us like Mary did, but what do you hear in your prayer life? What are you reading in Scripture in your personal devotional time with God? Right, have those conversations with, with people who follow Jesus in your life and, and say, you know, I think God might be saying this to me. What do you think about that? Right? We have these, these, these God-centered relationships. Right? I think God speaks to us a lot. And I'm guessing that some of us have been hearing from God and we might be hesitant to go forward because it might be pushing us out of our comfort zone. What are you hearing? And some of us don't know where to start and, and maybe the next step is to keep coming here and listen to the word or start reading your Bible or start praying or start getting in one of our small groups where you can establish relationships where people can help you to think about what might God be doing in your life. So brothers and sisters, where is God leading you to now? And are you willing to say, yes to that right? another thing maybe to consider out of this story is maybe god is calling you to be a messenger right maybe you your role is to be a messenger right to invite someone to church or to tell someone how god's been at work in your life right what what message of god might you share with someone maybe it's through words maybe it's through your actions maybe it's through both right maybe maybe god has use of you to be like a messenger one thing I'd like you to consider is something that we do uh, here at South Park Church. We, we have a tradition every Christmas is we give a gift to Jesus because ultimately Christmas right, is Jesus' birthday. Right? And maybe you're like me, sometimes we wrestle with the question, if, if Christmas is Jesus' birthday, why are we the ones that get all the presents? Right? And don't get me wrong, I like getting presents. I like giving presents to my wife, to my kids, right, my friends and stuff. It's important to give presents at Christmas. But 
But if it's Jesus' birthday, why are we getting the presents? And so we have a tradition here that we, we give Jesus a gift every Christmas. What do you give Jesus, right? Talk about shopping for someone who already has everything. Like Jesus is the impossible person to shop for, right? Because whatever Jesus wants, snaps his finger, he gets it. So what am I going to give Jesus, right? And so what we give to Jesus is a financial gift that we give to support two ministries out in the, in the community uh, that are doing great things. We take up a special Christmas Eve offering and we give 100% of it away, right? And this is our gift to say, Jesus, you don't need anything, but this is our way of honoring you. We, we find these ministries that are making a difference for you in the world and we wanna support that. And so our gift is a financial gift and we give it all away and we take that up on Christmas Eve. And uh, people ask, well, what should I give to that? And basically, what do you offer what you have, right? Some people say, okay, this person I'm buying for Christmas, this is the, the person I'm spending the most on. I'm gonna give that amount of money to the Christmas offering because Jesus is number one on my list. Others have said, this is everything that I'm spending on Christmas. I'm gonna give that amount of money to the Christmas offering because Jesus is on top of my list. And others give less, somewhere in the middle, right? Offer what you have as a gift to Jesus to say, Jesus, we wanna honor you on your birthday. And so, happy birthday. Just, it's an option, right? It's not a requirement, right? It's just an option that we have, right? So this Christmas Eve, super excited to tell you who we're going to be supporting, right? Two groups, we split, the, split it in half, right? So the first group uh, is Refugee Support Services here in Charlotte, right? This is a group that helps refugees who move into our community get their feet on the ground, right? They have these three words, arrive, survive and thrive, right? Can you imagine moving to another country where you don't know the language, you don't know the customs, but you have to because maybe you, you, you have an opportunity to get a job where you couldn't have one in your other country. Maybe you're fleeing some political situation, right? So you arrive, where do you start, right? So this group helps people who move into our city, right? Get their feet on the ground, find a place to live, find a job, how to get to the grocery store, right? How to find a place to worship, Right? How to get the kids in school, right? All those things that we take for granted that someone who's not from our community has a hard time doing, right? So you arrive, you survive, and then you get used to it and you're able to thrive, right? So RSS helps people from over 20 different nations get settled into our community. And they have begun to receive people from Afghanistan who are fleeing the tyranny there, have moved into our city. And this is a great way for us to say, welcome to our city, welcome to Charlotte. And by the way, Jesus loves you and we want to help you and we want to support this. So that's a powerful ministry that we're going to be supporting. There's some brochures out on the table out there. I'd love for you to check that out. We'll talk more about that throughout the series. And the other ministry that we're going to support is one that you might have heard of. We've helped them out before. It's New Story Church, which is a church uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It's the United Methodist Congregation. It's a missional church because basically their community is made up of people who are homeless and people who are battling addictions. Uh, and so New Story Church is doing amazing things in ministry there, but they just don't have a lot of money. And so they're relying upon other churches and other groups in the community to, to help fund their ministry. And in the past, we've helped them uh, build a second campus, right? They, they, they're reaching so many people, they needed another campus. And so one of our Christmas offerings helped them do that. Another Christmas offering helped them build a free medical clinic where people in the community who can't afford medical care can go and receive medical care for free. And so we're gonna hear more about what New Story Church is doing. So these are two ministries that we'll support with our Christmas offering, and it's a way to be a messenger for Jesus and to give Jesus a birthday present. Again, optional, uh, but we want to just give people options to give Jesus a really cool birthday present this year. Let's step back, though, for a second, back to Mary. Mary of Nazareth, Mary in the first century, as we think about her and how she relates to us, how does Christmas Day relate to modern day? And I want to go back to that question. What if Mary had said no to the angel Gabriel? You know what? Thanks for choosing me. Thanks for favoring me. But you know, it's a little bit too much for me. I'm just going to have to pass on this. What if Mary had said no to the angel Gabriel? Maybe her life with Joseph would have been a little bit easier. The reputations would have, would have not have been messed up, right? Maybe a little easier going. But here's what I think would happen that God would have sent Gabriel to someone else, another young woman who would have said yes, and she would have become the mother of Jesus who was born and ended up saving the whole world, right? God's plan would have moved on, absolutely. And Mary would have missed out on that. She would have missed out on being something 
bigger than herself, missed out on being part of the greatest story ever known, right? She could have said no, and if she had said no, she would have missed out on that. Brothers and sisters, don't miss out on what God has for you in your life. Don't miss out on the great things that God is calling you to do. Don't miss out on the the mission that God has for you or your family or this church, right? God has great and wonderful things, right? No matter where, if you come from Nazareth, no matter if you come from Sephora, if you you come from the, the hills of North Carolina, or you come from this great city of Charlotte, right? God has plans for you. Don't miss out on those, right? Where you came from matters, but not as much as where God is leading you now. Where you came from matters, but not as much as where God is leading you now. Say yes to Jesus and don't miss out on the great things that God has for you. Say yes to Jesus. Let's pray about that together. Gracious and ever loving God, we thank you for the story of Mary. We thank you, Lord, that you work through unexpected people in unexpected ways. God, we just want to take a moment and thank you that you also have plans for us. Whether we are watching online from a small town or whether we're here in Charlotte in this great big city that we live in, Lord, that no matter where we come from, God, you love us and you are ready to use us to make a difference in the world. And so God, help us to look back on our journey and be grateful from where we came from and the lessons that we've learned and the things that you've gotten us through, good and bad, but also help to help us to open our eyes, God, to see where we are now. What is it that you're calling us to as individuals, as a family, as, as a congregation, God? And may we be inspired that if you can use someone like Mary, you can use someone like us. And so God, help us to see where it is that you're calling us to right now. And help us to say yes to you, God, because we don't want to miss out on the great things that you have for us. In the holy and blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I invite you now to stand and sing our closing hymn.
Thank you so much for starting out your week with us here in worship. I invite you to come back next Sunday as we continue in the journey. And on your way out, for those of you who are here, please stop by the tables. A lot of cool things we wanna give you and let you take out into the world. Uh, if you're watching online, let us know how we can get them in your hands and we'd love to send you uh, some Advent stuff as well. Let us now receive the benediction, which means uh, the good word. Brothers and sisters, where you come from matters, but not as much as where God is leading you now. Open your hearts like Mary of Nazareth and say yes to God and be a part of something bigger than yourselves. May you have a wonderful week in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.